we are excited to have uh, Suburban Marine here with us today on our Scripps Technical Forum. Uh, my name is Vanessa Scott, and I'm the Director of Corporate Affiliates here at Scripps Oceanography. Uh, and I'm kind of standing in today for Douglas Alden, who's the chair of the Scripps Technical Forum. Um, he is the lead engineer for the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes here at Scripps Oceanography. And he's in the field today, having fun doing something. <laughs> Well, I'm on Zoom. Um, I definitely want to encourage everyone to have a very interactive discussion. We want to hear your questions. Um, so please feel free to drop them in the chat or through the Q&A in the bottom uh, center of your screen. Uh, also, I just wanted to let you know that this will be recorded and will be uh, shared on our Scripps Technical Forum YouTube channel later this week uh, and posted on the Scripps Technical Forum website, which I will also drop in the chat as well. Uh, we always welcome your feedback and suggestions on any companies or topics or speakers that you'd like to hear in the future. So please feel free to reach out. Uh, my email and Douglas's email are there on the screen. So feel free to reach out anytime to share your ideas and feedback. Uh, and with that, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers today. We are very excited to have Matt Moldovan and Jacob Schloss, who are local here in San Diego um, from Suburban Marine. And they are going to be talking about their rapid video system development with Opali. Um, so again, please make sure you have your questions um, through the chat. You can also feel free to raise your hand if you want to unmute yourself and talk directly um, to Matt and Jacob. And with that, I will hand it over to you. All right, thanks. So yeah, I'm Jacob um, from Super Marine. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, so. So a little bit about us, we're Suburban Marine. We're a boutiques engineering solutions company based you know, in, in um, San Diego, greater San Diego area. So we do a lot of software mechanical and electrical engineering consulting services, um, ranging from like embedded software on autonomous helicopters to like sensing platforms, computer vision platforms, kind of the gamut. And then you may also know us as the providers of the Veramax connectors, which is a new gigabit Ethernet ready full ocean depth connector that's different from the competitors because we can mass produce it and it's in stock. You don't have to go to the mold house. So, but oh, so the story behind Opali, um, we had this new connector family and we wanted to demonstrate it in the real world, you know, like. We're, we're a new product. Um, customers are asking us, like, you know, do you have any deployments? You know, how long have you been out in the field? So we said, okay, you know, um, my background is actually like aerial, aerial reconnaissance. So I've done a lot of work with cameras. It's like, okay, well, let's make a little camera pod. Let's, you know, let's get a camera, put it in the ocean. We can be able to dumb this demonstrate video streaming over gigabit that way. So we started with a GoPro and some Mikrotech wireless equipment. And we quickly realized that a lot of consumer equipment is not designed to be remote controlled. It's not designed to be integrated into a, a larger network. And we really couldn't do what we wanted to do or we couldn't like dynamically grab frames and stream them, you know, like across the US. So that prompted Opali, which is a new reference design for a smart underwater edge compute node. Um, it can, do all the basic you know video acquisition and low, low, low bandwidth sensor acquisition and then since we're based on the nvidia jetson family of processors we can also do things like run neural networks to do you know ai processing at the edge so the base implementation um, is a 4k 30 video camera with networking and poe power and time synchronization and a platform for accessory payload edge compute. So like, you know, we can take third party edge compute software and you know, third party tensor flow nets and run and run them next to our base like frame grabbing and sensor acquisition code. So what's, why is this is, oh, thanks Dan. Um, so, what makes this hard and why you can't just use something off the shelf, you know, one is there's a good bit of software compatibility issues um, and a lot of restrictions on how consumer equipment wants to be networked 
like a lot of times they have, you know, they want to talk one way to one IP address. They don't let you configure anything. And then also thermal design, like a lot of consumer equipment isn't designed to have high like heat flux. Like it's not designed to be in the sun and hot. And it's not designed to be cooled. So like, um, you know, conduction cooling, having heat spreaders, heat plates to like move heat from inside of cavities to outside of cavities isn't a thing you can really do with a lot of, a lot of off the shelf equipment. Um, so some of the magics in our mechanical design, um, these are mostly off the shelf parts, but with a, like, like a custom conduction cooled heat plate makes a big difference. So we have a, off the shelf the robotic six, um, six inch enclosure um, and then a custom water jet aluminum heat plate, it's just a flat plate. And then we can hard bolt to that the conduction cooling heat sink for, like, for an NVIDIA Jetson processor. Um, and so this lets us get, you know, we can burn a lot of power on the CPU get, and, get, and be able to get the heat out. And the cool part about this is all of these parts are off the shelf except for the camera mount and the um, the, the heat plate. So the bill materials is under $1,000. And we put it together in like, I don't know, two weeks, week and a half. <laughs> um, so electrical design, um, it has a single tether. Um, it's a built in 7939A, which is not like an ocean cable. It's just like an industrial ethernet cable. And it works, it turns out it works fine in shallow water. Like so we, we had it submerged for two or three weeks and it, didn't leak. Um, we're using off the shelf topside router. So this is a maker tick um, hex PoE. So this injects power and it provides the network services to the camera on the, the bottom side. We have a off the shelf carrier board from Avidia, um, which lets us carry a Jetson Nano or a Jetson Xavier NX. It provides things like, you know, local power regulation, connectors, plug sensors in. Um, so with these kind of components, we actually get all the flexibility we need to be very modular and very like mission agnostic. Um, so we have all the knobs to turn. So if we want to integrate different sensors or do different network architectures, we have the freedom to do so, which we didn't have in you know, the original GoPro prototype. So, so the other half of Opali is the software design. So we are an op open source software project, which kind of consists of like a C++ um, remote procedure call routing core that like takes commands from other network connected like robots or autonomous systems and then manages these requests and then you know, returns data, turns the cameras on and off. The video processing pipeline is written in GStreamer, which is a pretty high level API, giving us access to hardware acceleration and coding and, um, and um, like um, image, Im image processing pipelines. So it lets us target both like the NVIDIA Jetson family and we could potentially migrate to like an IMX8 with very little code rework because most of the code is written against GStreamer rather than against like NVIDIA hardware. Um, so, you know, we're designed to be portable and modular. Um, this, this kind of remote procedure processing core can let us serve a lot of different kinds of data. So if we want to um, add, so we can do, you know, high bandwidth video streaming through GStreamer, and we can also serve low bandwidth data through like JSON RPC calls to like easily integrate with other systems. And we can also do things like integrate zero MQ or RTPS to like, if you want to have like a ROS2 topic, we, we can just add a ROS2 adapter where the ROS2 adapter talks to our internal API. And then we can then publish to like your ROS topics to integrate into like a larger vehicle system. Um, so the current software interfaces are JSON RPC. Um, there's an embedded web server, so we can have a management web page. Um, we are, I was looking at doing Google Protobuf and zero MQ. Um, so we did actually add zero MQ support for um, raw frame publication to distribute like raw high, raw frames when you have a high bandwidth like ROV network. Um, and then also things like, you know, we have a Windows share if you just want to pull the videos off, you can do, you know, NTP or SSHFS to pull videos off. 
the normal stuff. Um, yeah, um, so we have the drivers to support over 75 models of scientific instruments, as well as um, deliver a large number of data products from that and can run some low level automated QC to, to dump and eliminate bad data. So almost plug and play, but um, for you all, it would be pretty easy to integrate any sensor. So you're just taking advantage of and, and trying to make things easier to integrate, get the data out. Um, so switching gears a little to talk about the back end network. Um, so we were looking at tethered fixed deployments for aquaculture. Um, and in this kind of installation, we have internet access. And so we actually want global remote peer to peer data, data, data flow. So like we want to drop this system behind someone's corporate firewall and be able to access our system and have our systems talk to each other, even though they're like in a, you could say hostile network or like a network that we don't control and don't do anything about. And we're like, we might not trust them, they might not trust us, but we need to have data, you know, we need to like get data, get data, get data through. So, you know, we're probably behind a NAT. We might only have IPv4. We might be behind a carrier grade NAT, like we might be using like T-Mobile's network, which doesn't let you have servers. Um, so the solution is to have a dial-in VPN and then get address space from one of the internet registries. Um, so this is the network architecture we ended up with. Um, so we have a central VPN server that gets a slash 48 of publicly routable IP address space from a tunnel broker or potentially RN. Um, this lets us assign publicly routable IP addresses to anyone that logs in. And so these Opalize systems that are embedded in corporate networks can like can dial into our VPN because they're given internet access and then they can get a they can join this virtual overlay network. And then to other users on the internet, the VPN for this this overlay network traversal is transparent. Like they just go to a URL, they just type in a URL and then they can talk talk to camera, even though it happens to be behind the network that otherwise wouldn't be able to talk to me. Um, and so like, and, and so this is a really cool technique that gives us um, a lot of control over the network that we wouldn't have if we were on a normal corporate network. Um, so there's still some problems with this. Um, I was talking about IPv6, so a lot of users are still IPv4 only. Um, and really in 2022, it's only possible to get IPv6 address space. So we would probably need to add a 6 to 4 translator or some proxy servers to give access to people who are stuck on IPv4 only networks. Um, but there are some workarounds. So we're registering with Aaron, which is the organization that assigns IP addresses in North America. So we're, we're registering as an ISP, actually. And then once we're registered as an ISP and we're issued an AS number, we're actually a full peer on the internet. So like we're able to broadcast routes to new IP addresses on the, on the thing that basically defines the internet, which is the global BGP peer. Um, and then as part of that, they'll assign us a, a block of IPv4 addresses that we can use as a six to four translator, like a NAT PT space to allow some trans, some, to allow at least a couple systems to get IP, IPv4 um, addresses. Um, but really the, for the future, people should be going IPv6 and then you can just assign like an IPv6 slash 64 routable network to like every installation. So like if you have a buoy with a couple sensors and a, and a network connection, like you can just, just assign an entire slash 64 to it. And then you can literally just have these buoys talk peer to peer or like across the internet. Like the way the internet was originally supposed to be used where everything is a first class peer with a public, with a public address. Um, and so, 
another cool project um, is we did a lot of work with time synchronization. Um, so we're very grateful for the opportunity to work with Mbari on this. Um, we were looking to synchronize things like camera shutters and strobes across a large network. This would be like a large like local network inside of, a, inside of an organization. Um, and we wanted time synchronized like the strobes and the camera shutters within you know a couple microseconds across what would potentially be like you know a couple hundred meters worth of cable. Um, so we compared um, the network time protocol with the precision time protocol and we found that you know P2P 1588 works pretty well. Um, and let's go to the next slide. So when you use PTP, you have to have special network hardware. So there is a time-serving grandmaster and a and switches that are 1588 aware. And when, if you have this hardware in your network, you can correct the time synchronization packets as they flow through the network. Um, and then we can achieve time synchronization better than 10 microseconds, and sometimes as good as one microsecond. And so this means like that the Linux top of a second matches the global UTC top of a second within one to 10 microseconds. Um, so just basically this lets for a lot of uses, this is good enough because like, you know, your, your frame time for a net for a picture is usually a couple milliseconds anyway. So as long as the top of frame is aligned within, you know, tens of microseconds, it, it, it's good enough. Um, and so here's so here we're comparing um, NTP with PTP. So the dark blue is the UTC top of second, and then the light blue and the yellow are two different camera systems attached across the network, and they're triggering their GPAOs as if they're going to trigger a strobe or a or a camera shutter. Um, so this is using an NTP, and they're about a millisecond apart, or half half millisecond apart, which is not good enough. Um, so if we turn on PTP, now we're clamped together with, you know, under 30 microseconds worst case, or under 47 microseconds worst case, and the average is more like half a microsecond. So, you know, the, we, we now have an average, like, like a falling edge to falling edge jitter of 500 nanoseconds. And this is just using software timers in Linux and a PTP time synchronizer. So like we don't have any special like IO handshake to, 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 to align these shutters. Um, just using like the HR, HR timer subsystem in Linux, just a high resolution like event timer. So this is pretty low effort actually. Like this was like a five or six line kernel forever just, just to use the HR timers from kernel space. Um, so, for a lot of applications now, we can do things like make a stereo camera across a large work class ROV or like a light field camera application would work pretty well. Um, and you can also use it if you have a larger like aquaculture facility and you want to time synchronize your, you know, your data logging. Like we can timestamp the incoming like sensor readings pretty accurately across like a wide area network, like maybe a couple kilometers ago. Because um, PTP scales up to like, you know, network backbone sized networks where you have like cell phone towers across California and you want them to be time synchronized, it works great for that. So it scales upwards as far as you want to go, like network size. So future work we're looking at doing, um, I want to add H.265 support. Right now we're H.264 only, so it'll just help reduce, reduce our band bandwidth usage. And then system-wise, we need to add some, you know, we're looking at an external lights, you know, a wiper servo, some, some um, maybe a pan tilt servo in, in, internally, and then hopefully start adding more payloads. So, you know, other sensors, like we're looking at doing dissolved oxygen in the near term, maybe some other sensors. So we're definitely, we're definitely looking for payloads to write, like to write along with us, basically. And because we, we, want, we want to host other, other, other payloads. So here's a picture of our recent recent deployment at a um, oyster farm. Um, so we we want to provide industrial building blocks for maritime use. You know we're we're trying to increase the capabilities of the bottom end of the market. You know we want to bring things like universal addressing and virtual overlay networks to the like $500 class devices. Like 
these are things that are not that hard, but generally take a little bit of organization. It's like, you know, if you don't have a full-time IT department supporting your network, it's hard to get this stuff to work, but it's would be really nice to just make the bottom end stuff easier. Like, let's make a thing where, you know, rather than ingesting the video stream, like we can just get the frames with an RPC call, you know, like, but I want to design some building blocks that are actually meant to be integrated into larger systems rather than just, you know, make, instead of just being a fixed function consumer device. So um, we're looking to provide, you know, ref reference kits. Um, we're looking to do customization integration services. Um, so, you know, we're, we're hoping to make this a, a platform to, that we'll grow with, you know, and keep adding features to both for our own experimentation and for other, you know, other people's use. Um, the software is open source, um, you know, and the mechanical drawings are also um, open. So, you know, feel free to make derivative designs or, you know, rip, rip features out, add features in. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jacob and Matt. Um, now we'll open it up for questions. So Douglas and Nathan, feel free to raise your hand if you want to be unmuted and ask a question or feel free to just drop in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, I guess I have a question for you guys. Um, obviously, you know, you're looking for um, people that wanna kind of connect with you guys and use your equipment. What kinds of projects or research do you see uh, working best with Opali and, and kind of what was your vision um, of where you think it might uh, be most effective or kind of, I don't know, projects that you had in mind? You know, in the, in the near term, um, because the power requirements on the, this implementation are, um, pretty high compared to long-term ocean deployments. Um, we're looking at coastal applications, um, marine protected areas. We, we really want to grow and develop this, this network of kind of cable observatories in order to facilitate those longer term deployments. Um, let's, in my mind, in our mind, it's, it's like, let's, let's start putting a lot of these nodes in the ocean we have we've sketched out like a 100 node deployment in an mpa and then let's give those give those nodes to people in remote areas um grad students so they can just write python and, and play with these things instead of having you know scientists and computer scientists have to go in the water and figure out how to do the stuff um let each person kind of stay in their swimming lane you know, we'll take care of the, the foundation, the networking, the backbone, and then it's just a Linux computer in a bottle. It's so you can do anything. Nice. And I don't know if you mentioned, but are there like depths that they've been tested at or, you know, what, what are kind of like the, the metrics for that? The, so the one you saw at six inch, it, it provides enough space so that we can add and remove features. It's off the shelf. Um, that, will go down to 300 meters um, and going deeper, changing the hardware, um, that's actually quite easy. Um, so if there is a special, specialized application, like we need a thousand meter version and such and such a camera, then things can be machined pretty easily. Obviously the, the customization part is, is sometimes expensive, but we're, we're here to say it's just software. It's very flexible and using a different computer is, is very easy. Great. And if people are interested in connecting and want to learn more about maybe specific specifications for their research needs or projects, um, what's the best way to get in touch with you guys? And kind of, are you looking for um, anything specific? Uh, yeah, just email us, uh, call us. We're here. Drive up to Oceanside if you want. Um, it's it's pretty mellow. We you know we actually love to talk about what your problems are. Um, again, I want to see the the chemists go back to focusing on chemistry and not like data logger design, because currently, I mean, 
you have to hire a couple engineers and develop a data logger and just to get the data to start doing your work. And we're saying these building blocks exist now. We're providing the building blocks to get data flowing freely, almost as easy as kind of getting a SIM card and having your, your phone be on the network. It, it really is almost that easy. <laughs> so yeah, just reach out. Um, and if you have any colleagues that are doing similar stuff, I've seen some interesting, let's say low cost integrated systems. Um, but in the end, when, when you look at the hardware, it's, it's still tinkering. It's, it's not a rugged design. It's based on a Raspberry Pi that's booting off of like an SD card and a couple alkaline batteries duct taped together. And we're saying, look, we're providing way more industrial building blocks for the same and even lower cost. So let's, let's build this tool base so that things are more reliable and expandable than wasting time on like hardware development. That's what we're good at. So we're looking for scientists, for colleagues, um, anyone. Excellent. I really like the idea of the marine protected network or uh, areas, especially we've got so many of them here off California. So that would be probably a great. Um, yeah, and so we we vied like adding hydrophones to this to this thing. Um, we can do edge processing to reduce your data offload requirements. And I know that you know the the way they still count fish is sometimes they send a diver down and and use a tiny spear gun to shoot the fish and then uh, extrapolate from there. So we're, we're looking at better ways to do this. So there is one question. Yeah, I see. Nice Douglas. work, Douglas. Excellent. You want me to, I'll read it off just for, <laughs> so Douglas is asking, though not directly rated, related to the programming, is the age old problem of biogrowth upon lenses. Has this problem been resolved either chemically or do you have control of the mechanical interaction? So funny. Um... <laughs> After about a week, we couldn't see out the camera anymore for our first install. <laughs> so we are going to be adding a mechanical wiper. And so the answer is, yeah, we have we have tons of extra I.O. and tons of extra power. We have servos provisioned. Um, and but no, we haven't solved the holy grail of biofouling. Um, the Navy has up to probably a trillion dollars investing in that. Uh, but we can mitigate it. And for it, it's a game you have to play. So we're gonna add basically a wiper and a brush. And if it gets bad enough, you can see it on the camera and just go clean it. Um, you know, it, it's worth mentioning, like we've, demon, we're, we've demonstrated that you can stream really high bandwidth things, 4K video and do it very easily. These can also just be low bandwidth sensors without um, optical imaging. So it is basically a data logger with software and networking at, at the core. Uh, you can't, sometimes you can't see very well here in SoCal. Excellent. Thanks for the question, Douglas. Nathan, any questions from you? <laughs> I don't think of any others. All right. Well, I think we've got all the questions we had answered. If you guys have any final thoughts or asks for the group or anyone else that's watching a recording of this after. Yeah, we're here and we're looking for to solve those challenging problems. Um, like, like Jacob said, um, we're working on some expanding this toolkit to, to kind of enable people to build these blocks. We want to stop rewriting software over and over for special projects so that we can actually do science. Great. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your presentation today and your time. And I encourage everyone who uh, is interested in connecting with Matt and Jacob to go ahead and reach out to them. Um, I will also say we have some uh, new uh, script technical forums coming up in April. Uh, Friday, April 1st, we'll be having Teledyne. 
um, give a presentation. And then on April 7th, we'll be hearing from Subsea Imaging. So thank you both again, really appreciate it. Uh, again, this recording will be posted on the Scripps Technical Forum website, uh, which I've dropped in the chat. And uh, we are always open to your ideas. So please feel free to reach out to myself or Douglas Alden where, with any requests for future topics. And with that, I will wish you all a wonderful afternoon and see you soon in April. Thank you. Thank you.